Our brains are constantly telling us stories. Now, I've had the privilege of studying the brain for a fair number of years. And I think it's a fascinating organ, right? It's 80 billion neurons. That's a huge number. I'm not interested in any of them. I'm interested in the connections between them, which is on the order of magnitude of 125 trillion connections. There's a lot going on between your ears. It's the same number of connections as saying there's 1,500 Milky Way galaxy stars up here. That's wild. And it's where brain scientists get really haughty and we're like, yes, this is a complex topic. Don't let them fool you, because it's not. Because when it comes down to it, every single one of your behaviors, every single one of them, relates back to two things and two things alone. What are they? Survival's one. Sex, Sex is the other. Sex and survival. These guys have heard me before. Sex and survival, that's it. Literally all day long, this is what you're doing. Can I procreate with that? Oh shit, that's scary. That's all you're doing. That's all you're doing. So we like to think, right, that we're these complex savants of the animal world. Uh-uh. This is your brain. Whoops. This is your brain, okay? Your brain is a lot more simple than you think. And that's not a problem, okay? The problem is that your brain is constantly filling in the gaps for you. What you think is complex behavior is just a story that you're telling. So in front of you, you have what looks like a bookmark. It's a blind spot test. If you'll humor me, go ahead and grab that. Here's what we're going to do. Take a look at the black side first. I want you to close or cover your left eye and focus your right eye onto the plus sign. Put the bookmark sort of towards the center of your face like this. All right, closing your left eye, focus your right eye onto that plus sign, keep it focused on that plus line, and slowly move the bookmark away from your nose. Something magical is going to happen at about arm's length. Y'all see it? What happens? Circle disappears. Woohoo! If you don't see it, don't worry, keep practicing. You'll get it. About arm's length. How many other things does your brain just fill in for you? What are the stories that it tells for you that you're not even conscious are being filled in? Now this is going to be the scariest thing that I tell you all day long, so take a deep breath, get nice and centered. Your brain is processing about 400 billion bits of information every single second. You are consciously aware of 2,000 of those. So if y'all want to do the math with me really quick, that means that 99.9999999% of the time, you're operating from your subconscious brain. What are the stories that your subconscious brain knows? Have you explored them? My guess is you probably haven't. And if you have, have you worked to change them? It's a whole nother level. What's the blonde stereotype? <laughs> right, they're ditzy, they're dingy, they're whatever, okay? You know it. Don't lie to me, I know you know it. So what is it? Give me some examples of the stereotypical not people you work with. I did this a couple weeks ago, somebody was like, damn it! I was like, oh God, no. Not people you work with, but the stereotypical blonde, some celebrity examples, who do we have? Paris Hilton, Jessica Simpson, Goldie Hawn, Reese Witherspoon. Kristen Bell, I do this, I ask this question every single time I give a talk. And I've gotten hundreds of thousands of people to give me responses and I get the same ones every time. This one comes up. There's one response that I've never gotten. You ready for it? Or any male for that matter. See, I, I don't think you guys are biased against blondes. And I'm not just talking to the guys. I can ask all women this and we do the same thing. These are the subconscious stories that we don't even recognize we have associations with. Dumb, ditzy, huh? That only applies to the females. And here's the, probably the most dangerous piece of these stories is that you don't even have to believe in the story. I don't think blondes are dumb. You don't have to believe in the story to act from within it. So I'm going to tell you right now, do you see that square A and that square B? I'm going to tell you that they're the same color. That's the truth. Do you believe me? 
course not. So now I'm gonna show you, and you can see it now, yes? You can see this is an objective truth. There's nothing subjective about it. I can put a spectrograph up there. I can measure it with every scientific instrument. Those are the same color. You got it? You know the truth? Cool, hold on to the truth. Still got it? So you lost it, didn't you? Try again, it's okay. Here's the truth. You know the truth. You know that women are equal to men. You know that blacks and whites are equal. There's no difference. They, hang on to that. You know that gay, straight, it doesn't matter. Hang on to those stories. Hang on to it. Oops, oops, go back. Did you lose it again? It's so hard to change our subconscious stories. See, the story that you have here is that B is in shadow, right? That yellow cylinder is casting a shadow, and that's the story that your brain has always learned even though it's not true. So what are the stories that you have? What are the stories that you tell? So I just, in your heads, you don't have to write anything down. You can if you want to. In your heads, I want you to explore something really quickly. Pick a family member. It could be a spouse, a sibling, parent, child. Pick a family member, somebody who's close to you. What would they say is your best quality and your worst quality? Think about it. Jot it down if you want. Do the same thing for a friend for a colleague, for a stranger. Now, strangers, that's, that seems really bizarre. A stranger doesn't know anything about me. How can they tell a story? Do you know me? Do you tell stories about me? I guarantee the second I walked in the room, you started telling a story about me. Good or bad, I don't know what it is. But the story starts with this. First three things you know is about a person. Age, race, gender. Can I procreate with that? Oh, that's a threat. That's all we're doing. Age, race, gender. So you start telling those stories. Oh, and now you see, oh, she's tall. That's a story. You don't know me, but you're telling stories. And I'm doing the same thing about you. So think about this for a second. We give you like 15 seconds to think about this. Got it? Feeling good about this? Single question for you. Whose stories are they? They're yours, right? They're yours. And here's the big question. Whose story do you control? That's it, yours. Yours and only yours. And yet you're willing to say some pretty nasty things about yourself, aren't you? Because my my spouse thinks this, and my sister thinks that, and my brother thinks that, and this, and that, and those are your stories. And we spend our whole life trying to control the stories of others. I'm gonna say this two more times because it's so important. All of our stress in our life comes from trying to control the stories of others. And yet, we do a terrible job of controlling our own story. We do a terrible job. You would never say that about your best friend or your sibling or your parent or your child or your, and yet, here you are telling yourself. Anybody here allergic to poison ivy? Oh, Nathan, you should not have raised your hand, buddy, front row. So if I was a mean person, again, not a story that I tell, but if I was mean, <laughs> I'd have brought in some poison ivy. Actually, I'd have brought in a maple leaf, but I would have told Nathan that it's poison ivy, and I'd said, hey, buddy, how you been? I just would have rubbed that poison ivy all over his arm and said, oh, dude, you're not allergic to poison ivy, are you? What happens if I do a good enough job convincing Nathan that I don't have a maple leaf in my hand, but I have poison ivy? He believes it, and he breaks out. Now, he doesn't just start itching. He breaks out in the exact rash as if I'd take po taken poison ivy and rubbed it all over his arm. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't do it myself to dozens of people. <laughs> Pretty evil like that. Now here's the cool thing. Here's the cool thing. Now I can tell Nathan right now, hey buddy, don't worry, it's a maple leaf. And I can show him the maple leaf. One of two things happens. Either he's like, oh, thank God. And he believes me. And his rash goes away real quick. Or he's like, dude, you duped me once, whatever. And he's going to suffer with that for weeks. This is a part of the talk that I, I sometimes hesitate telling people because there's a lot of people on prescription medications. And if it, you go home tonight and they stop working, sorry. 
30% of the prescribed medications, what your doctors write you, and you go and you pay good, solid money for, are sugar pills. They're placebos. They do nothing biologically. Now, that does not mean they don't work. This is just the thing doing all the work. When your mind believes something, and it believes it strongly enough, those stories manifest physically. It's like this. So what story do you want to write? What is your story? You recognize these, yes? Life goals? What are your stories in those, in those areas? What do you tell yourself? What's your true story? Well, I've got a true story for you. I'm a loving and caring partner. That's a true story of mine, I think. Maybe I'm not as capable as others. Story I tell, financially secure. I'm an athlete. These are stories that I tell. Now, I'm here to say some bad news. They're BS. Those are all complete lies. Completely lies. I might believe them, but how do I know that to be true? How do you know anything to be true? I'm a loving and caring partner. What does that mean? How, what have I done recently? I'm not as capable of, of as others. I went out and got more degrees than I care to count to prove something to somebody. Maybe to myself. Financially secure. That's why I quit my job and I sold my house. And I was like, ah, oh, I have bills to pay. Huh. See, all of these are stories because our beliefs dictate our actions in life. And our beliefs come from a place of subconscious stories. Stories that you haven't really explored yet. Our beliefs dictate our actions. What are your actions? If you want to learn your story, you have to explore your actions. What makes you a loving partner? What makes you financially secure? What are your actions? What are your actions? I want to explore that a little bit more deeply. But I want to start by telling this story. Pepsodent. Pepsodent is the first commercial toothpaste in America, circa 1900s. Nobody is brushing their teeth. It is a massively failing company. So what do they do? Well, they come up with a common enemy. They create a common enemy. Incredibly powerful technique. Here's what they say. They say all the good moral people of the world, they brush their teeth. And those animals, what a story. Those animals with tooth film, gross, disgusting beans. Wow, they started selling toothpaste. Let me tell you, that is a powerful story right there. And then, the piece de resistance. You ready? Not that, but if you find it, I will give you my shipping address, because bacon-flavored toothpaste is on my list. Really? Nobody? OK. Here's what they did. They added a mild irritant to the formula. OK, you know that so fresh, so clean feeling you get when you brush your teeth? And you feel like you did such a good job, because there's all these bubbles coming out, and you're like, oh, the tingle. That tingle? is your mouth being angry with you. They added a mild irritant to the formula, so your mouth goes, ow. And you're like, oh, I'm doing so good. And now I'm foaming at the mouth, because there's all these bubbles that also do nothing. So you're foaming at the mouth, your mouth is going, ow, and you're like, I'm amazing. It's the story you tell. And now you know the truth. So how many of you right now are going to race home and buy toothpaste that doesn't have bubbles or the tingle? Right. You know why? Because your beliefs dictate your actions. And you still somewhere, somehow believe that that's doing something. Because it's a story you've been told for however long you've been brushing your teeth. Until you control your actions, until you change your actions, your beliefs are going to control you. And you'll do stupid things like hurting the inside of your mouth because you think you're doing a good job brushing your teeth. I recognize that you all are here because you are experts. You are. And that's a great thing. And you should own that. And it's an important story to tell. However, recognize that you are also surrounded by experts. And they each have their own expertise and their own stories and their own set of rules. 
that are just as valid and just as important as yours. So experts in the room, you are all experts, yes? yes. Verbal confirmation time, you can all count to 10. Yes. Cool, and you all know the letters of the English alphabet. Yes. Excellent, then I have a very simple question for you. All I want you to do is to count the number of Fs in that sentence, and when you do, show me with your fingers how many Fs are in that sentence. Two, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, two, three, seven, three, three, six, seven, three, seven, six, two, two, three, three, six, five, two, three. Come on, experts! <laughs> do we need to do this together? Four. You're surrounded by experts, aren't you? Five, three. Those of you that aren't showing me your fingers, you want to give me one finger, and that's fine. <laughs> Here's the deal. Let's do it together. We got finished files. No problem, right? You got scientific. You missed of, 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 of. There's seven. <laughs> What's going on? You told me you're experts at this. I think, I think you have a story. And I think the story goes something like this. F says, so finish, file, scientific, no problem. F does not say of. So you don't even see it. It doesn't even exist to you. Doesn't even exist. This is, uh, this is often the pyramid that I'm given in behavioral classes where you have these experiences. Whatever your story is, you have an experience and that drives your beliefs. And that will drive your actions and ultimately your results, yes? That makes sense. That makes sense. What on there can you control? That's it. Right? You can't control your, you can't really control your experiences, and your experiences really do directly drive your beliefs. Those are all subconscious. Here's what you can control. You can control your actions, and when you control your actions consciously, guess what? That moves the whole thing into consciousness. So now, your actions are going to drive your results, but they're also going to drive your experiences and your beliefs. Here's what that looks like. So, I want you to think about a kid at Christmas. When you were a kid, and you believed in Santa Claus, right? And you've got this situation. You believe in Santa Claus, and yet your experiences as you grow older, and you're like, oh, flying reindeer? And getting around the whole world in a night? And coming up, this doesn't, your experiences start to separate. And what happens when your experiences and your beliefs separate like this? What happens? Yeah. Right? Your beliefs ultimately, ultimately, your beliefs are going to snap towards your experiences. And again, if you're not controlling your experiences, which most of us can't, it's hard to control your beliefs. And then that story changes. So what can we control once again? So here's what you need to do. If you take action, if you move the actions, all you have to do is change your belief a little bit and guess what? All you have to believe is that much. If you're acting it already, your beliefs, your expectations, your story, whew, your whole experience changes. My favorite quote of all time. We do not rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. If you have not trained yourself, if you have not trained and retrained those subconscious stories you're telling, you're going to continue to fall and fall and fall back to them. You will not rise to the level of your expectations. You will fall to those subconscious stories. Be willing to dig in and change those subconscious stories by taking actions. You guys have something special here. You really do. Um, like nine-tenths of my job is getting people uh, to change who don't want to change. You have friends like that? Who are like they like love to call you and kind of in your ear about... Oh, we have kids. I'm sorry, uh, Lanny. I have to temper myself here. Uh, yeah, she's heard it from Dad. <laughs> sorry, Joe. We're convincing people who don't want to change. Often I'll be, someone will say, oh, you're a motivational speaker. And I'll say, no, I'm actually not. Uh, I don't think you can motivate people who don't want to be motivated. How many of you want to be motivated here? How many of you are motivated? We know that stories control our lives, like Rebecca shared with us. We know that we tell ourselves stories. We tell our stories about why we're frustrated, why we're annoyed, why our friends on Facebook suck, right? We tell ourselves these, these stories. 
So if we know that we need better stories in our lives, which I think we all agree, do we? We need better stories. We want to level up our stories. Who wants better stories? Come on, raise your hand. Who, tell me, who wants better stories? Right here? You want better stories? Why don't we tell better stories? And when thought about this, why? We know we're in a bad mood. And we know if we go see, we call on someone, we're going to do our morning briefing in a bad mood, we know we're not going to get the best results. We know we're not going to find the best in ourselves. And we can't find the story to unkink all of that brokenness inside us. How many of you have found yourself there? How many of you woke up in a day this week there? I got hands, feet, toes, everything up. There are two fundamental reasons that before we leave today, we're going to have lunch, breaking this up in the middle, and then we're going to leave at the end of the day. I want to impress upon you that there are two reasons, and only two reasons, only two things you need to master, and you will figure out how to tell yourself better stories. And I'll just tell them to you right now. Number one, you can't tell yourself better stories if you don't control your thoughts. And you can't tell yourself better stories if the actions you try to change are too big. So today, all we're going to talk about is how to take tiny, tiny, tiny changes, tiny, tiny, tiny micro actions like this. This is all we're doing today, tiny micro actions, and how to control our thinking. That's it. In writing my book, I think all of you you have a copy or you're getting a copy, something like this. I, uh, I put some of my story in there, in that first chapter. I mean, you know, I've spoken to millions of people around the world, and it, it's always awkward to me that everyone knows more about me than I know about them. What was cool about yesterday is I got to hear a little bit of your stories, which I feel like balances the scale. So thank you for all of you sharing and being willing to be open. When I wrote that book, and I didn't intend for it to be a bestseller, I was trying to share why is it that some people, I was trying to figure out this, answer this question, why is it that some people have everything going for them and there continue to be fuck-ups? You have friends like this? Maybe family members? <laughs> they, they got the great job and everything, and then there's everything kind of, it's like a mess. And then there's some people who you kind of look at them and they're like a little awkward socially. I'm this guy, you know, and I'm kind of bumbling around. And, and when I'm the guy on my running shoes. The fronts are all chipped up because I'm hitting my feet against the rocks and falling over like a fool. And everyone else is kind of prancing elegantly down the trail. And, and it just feels like it's clunky and it's a grind. But why is it that some people who shouldn't win win and others, right, who have everything going for them and the degrees and the money, they, they fail? So I began to read stories. Some of the stories were in the book. The book would be way too big if I included the thousand plus stories that I researched. But one story that's not in the book, and I shared it when Tyler asked me to speak, and I'm going to share it with you this morning quickly, is simply this. <clears throat> Some 3,000 years ago, the greatest king who ever lived died in his mid-30s, Alexander the Great. He had conquered more of the known world than anybody ever. But actually, this story isn't about him. It's about a, a lesson he learned from his father. His father was named Philip, Philip of Macedon. Philip did something amazing in the history of war that no one had ever done before. He figured out how to conquer without bloodshed. Traditionally, it's like Game of Thrones, right? You go out there, you grab a sword, and you just start chopping people's heads off. And when enough heads are on the ground, you're like, OK, I think we won, right? Either that or we go bowling or something. It's like, it's over. End of day, we go home. Well, Philip realized, hey, listen, if I go and destroy and burn down villages, then now as king, I'm ruling a country of dead people, I'm of villages and castles that are burned to the ground, and this isn't working. So he engineered this really cool system where he would go up to the, to the gates of a village, and he would just say, hey, Here's how we're going to do this. <laughs> I'm going to be the king. And look behind me, because I've got this whole army back here. And uh, so you're just going to let me have, you know, give me some gold, give me some beautiful women, you know, throw in a couple ties each year. We're going to be good. And city state after city state, all around Greece, all these uh, the rulers said, you know, that's, that's probably a pretty good deal, right? Does it sound like a good deal? I let you live. You can live. You can live your life. 
and you're even kind of the pretend leader. You still kind of rule yourself and you rule your village, but I'm, I'm the boss. City state after city state decided this was the best way to go. It wasn't until they came to the very edge of Greece, on the cliffs of the, of the, the very edge of the border of Greece, there was this little colony called Lakotia. Anyone ever heard of this little place? Bet you, bet you have. So when they came to Laconia, they did their usual song and dance, came up to the gates. They said, look, we're going to let you live, but you're going to give us stuff, money, beautiful women, et cetera, et cetera. And the rulers of Laconia said, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> we, that's just not how we live our life. We can't accept your deal. Now, again, if, if this, this were me, my kids all the time tell me no, right? And I don't handle it well. But Philip of Macedon was apparently a better dad than I am. He sent back a message to the rulers of Laconia. And he did, it, he did it in a very, very clear way. He sent his most expensive ambassadors on their most expensive horses with the, the purple robes and the feathers coming off the back of the head of the horse like they're unicorns. And they had golden chariots that rolled right up to the gates of the village. And of course, the rulers of Laconia opened the doors and let him in. Came right to the middle of the town square, slowly stepped off the horses. You know the whole pomp and circumstance thing meandered to the middle of the village, and then they pulled out a, a message for the rules of Lakota. And it was, we have to kind of water this down for the young ears, but it basically said this from Philip of Macedon to the rulers. He said, if I beat you, I'm going to kill all your sons. I'm going to rape all your daughters. All of you men will have things missing that you don't want missing. So you should probably surrender. According to the history books, right, we're writing this story looking back now. That would have been the end of the matter. Greatest king who had ever lived shows up with lots of money, lots of soldiers, and basically says to you, if I beat you, it's going to be really bad. I want you to know what the odds are. When the ambassadors got back to Philip of Macedon, they handed him that piece of parchment. That same piece of parchment, he had delivered that message to the, to the rulers of Laconia. On it was a single word. If. <laughs> if. See, here's what's amazing. Here's what's amazing. And by the way, I should have probably told you this. We, we, don't, we don't call it Laconia. In fact, 300 years before, 150 years before that, we, at the Battle of Thermopylae, we knew these guys by a little, a little different name, Sparta. And on that piece of paper was the word that defined not just a moment of like rare valor, rare courage, where some guys bucked up and said, You're, we know we're going to push back on you. What was on that piece of paper was the word, if you beat us, if you beat us, the rest of the world said it's obvious that we're going to lose, right? The rest of the world said, of course, you've got more money, you've got more time, you've got more soldiers. But, but the Spartans said, hey, it's not a foregone conclusion because 150 years earlier, a bunch of us in the Valley of Thermopylae took on several million of you. This story has stayed with me forever. And I'm sure I add a few details that weren't actually there. But this is how I see my story, if Rebecca were here. This is my story. So what was it? What was that thing? What was that thought process that automatically wired these people to do something a little bit different? One thing we have to understand about our thoughts is that the thoughts we have create the stories that we live by. But the thoughts that we have are not an accident. The thoughts that we have are the result of who we are. I was born number two out of five in my family. My older brother missed one question on his SAT. I learned early on I was not, sold his first company to appear in Greenville, talk about amazing Greenville people, started one of the first startups, sold it to Fawcett Software, $2 billion education company. That's not Dan Walshman. I dropped out of college twice. But I learned early on I was the guy uh, who, in high school, my senior year, not only did I win piano performance, I had 
came number one in the nation for some random speech competition, had number three in the nation for a science fair competition, and started a business that paid my entire way through college. And that's when I started learning that if I could work 90 hours a week, um, this 13, 14 year old kid, I don't know how you learn that stuff at that age, if I could start developing those skills at that age, I could outpace all of my competitors. Because when things got tough, they were gonna quit, and I was dumb, and so the only way for me to keep going was to not quit. Anyone else have an identity like that? I'm not smart, but I'm gonna fucking outwork you? And hold them up, hold them up, look around. How many of you have gotten smarter the harder you work? Yeah, put both hands up. Yeah, and, and I was t it's the hardest thing for the world for me to go to these big tech companies and tell them, listen, it doesn't come work smart, then work hard. It goes like this, you work hard, then you work smart, right? Because you don't know how to work smart until you work hard enough. Okay, so identity, identity, I work hard, right? What makes you unique? Did you write it down? What makes you unique? Unique. By the way, unique is not like slightly different. What's that thing? What's that thing deep down that you go to? What makes me unique? Okay, question number two. This one's a little, this one's deeper. This one's deeper. I want you to ask yourself this hard question. What are the patterns of my life? Are you somebody who makes a little bit of money, then you lose it? Are you someone who you're like, man, every, all my friends, they're, you know, they're just disrespectful. Or, they, you know, when I need people, no one's around. Or, or every personal relationship I have ends in disaster. Maybe the patterns of my life are the people I trust take advantage of me. By the way, notice these patterns. It seems like it's happening to us. But notice what I asked you. What are the patterns of your life? Pretty cool, because it goes back to number one about what makes you unique, well, what's your gift. And then you look at number two about the patterns and the question we have to ask ourselves is, if we're great at these things, and you truly know it, right? Because I, I, I feel like what you just said. I, I had my hands in a lot of things, owned a lot of companies, uh, you know, had books here and, and communities, and I thought one day, I, I am not great. I am not living to the standard of Dan Walshman. Like, everyone else thinks it's wonderful, but I, I know the truth, that it's all just mediocre. And just because it's better than a bunch of other people, just because you are better than the rest of the, 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 the sales, doesn't mean that you're great. It just means you're better than average. Right? Question number three. We're going to get a little bit deeper, even more than the patterns. Who can I trust? i got to double take. Who can I trust? So think about who you, can you trust. Can you trust yourself? On one level, you can, right? On one level, you can. Uh, like you said about a survivor. You don't know how you're going to survive. I think that's the thing about, like, uh, The Walking Dead, right? You just, you, some of those guys, uh, you just don't know how you're going to stay alive. And, of course, it's just TV, but you just do it. You just figure it out. On, on the other hand, um, if you're looking for a way out, you'll always find one. You can either go long, or you can go fast, or you can go far, right? If you're going to go fast, go by yourself. If you're going to go far, go with a group. That's why you're here. I don't think anyone's here to go fast, right? Although Trey is proving us all wrong. <laughs> I think we're here to go far, right? Aren't we? That's why we're huddled up on a weekend when you can be out golfing or doing whatever you're doing, right? Can I give you question number four? Yes. Will I be wealthy? We just switched gears, didn't we, people? Uh, not, me for, not, not for me to determine that. It's just a question. Will I be wealthy? I tell my kids this every day. Nothing wrong with being wealthy, right? Nothing wrong with it. You know, it's, it's how the world runs. And you can be completely delusional about it, but you're just as crazy to go try to drive your car without gas in the tank. You don't get very far. Will you be wealthy? If you're going to live the life of your dreams, you must be. You must be. We can argue about whether that's financial or spirit. I, I'm not going to argue with you. You have to be wealthy. Are we on the same page? How many of you are going to be wealthy? I am wealthy. You are wealthy. I am wealthy. I am wealthy. I love it. Number five, what will make my life matter? 
what will make my life matter. So here's my challenge to us. If each of you wrote down what matters, are you doing those things? How many of you look at your list? Take a moment. Just take a second and think about your list, which you wrote down, especially number five. How much of last week did you spend on those things? When was the last time, not just did we focus on what matters, when, did we, when was the last time we took a moment to think about what matters? I'm, I'm way on our schedule. One of the things I had on our schedule was to do a, a meditation. How many of you meditate regularly? How many of you use, yeah, I'm like, my hand's up, but it's like this. I have a tickler on my calendar to do it. Uh, while Rebecca was finishing up, I took a moment to pause and just kind of clear my head and, and meditate for a minute. One of the, one of the pra practical reasons for meditation is not to you know, transcend. I think very few of us will. <laughs> Maybe Nathan. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's, to, it's to clear our mind of the fear. What do I need to survive? It's to clear our mind of all the fear and panic that builds up in a day. Is that meeting going to get canceled? And what about my kids? And how about that? And what's going on over here? It's to clear our minds so that we can just operate at a level that are doing things that matter. You know, you don't become a superstar overnight. You don't change habits overnight. You know, you have to get started. So what today is, is literally the first day of all the other days. And it doesn't matter what has been. It matters what you choose to do next. And then it matters what you convince yourself with by your new actions. It's a choice you get to make. And you'll have people who are doing other things, right, different than you. They'll have people who tell you you're crazy. There are people who tell you, oh, your priorities are out of whack. There are people who tell you, you know, you're wasting your time. It's never going to work. And here's what I would encourage you by. Those same phrases were told to every successful person who you've ever read a story about since the beginning of time. And so if you want to be one of those people who has stories written about them, then you don't quit when you have something go wrong or when a situation backfires on you. You persist. And when you fail, because there are good days where you're not going to pull over, and meditate. You're going to be like, shit, I should have done that. And so it's not beating yourself up. The next day, you just pull over. And that's your first day, right? And same with push-ups or same with language, whatever else you're trying to do. All you do is one step at a time, right? Something simple like this. How many of you have ever eaten a light bulb before? Yeah, like lunch. No, never. I can't believe it. You guys are so limited, you know? Like this. So, you know, this is a lot like what each of you talked about, your goals. So, eating a light bulb is actually not that hard. You, you want me to show you how to do it? Does it seem a little bit crazy? That's how you eat an elephant, one bite at a time. You don't need a light bulb one bite at a time. So, first we, we can't eat it because I'm not just going to bite the whole thing, right? I'd be bad. And I've spent too much money on these things, too. So let's take it a step at a time, right? First, let's give it a crack. Yeah, I did it. So now, inside, instead of our big goal, we've got a few smaller goals. Now, of course, this is sharp, right? You can see. We cut. In your neck, you've got a bunch of veins, like this is where in the movies bad things happen. But eating a light bulb is not that hard, really. In fact, just a couple bites at a time. It doesn't lose its sharpness. It's still the same. Light bulb, it was there, right? So what changed? So a light bulb 
didn't start off as a light bulb, right? What did it start off as? Huh. So if it started off as sand, and I'm good at what I do, and don't fuck it up. <laughs> What's it turned back into? Did you guys start off life with limitations? Everything you did was about breaking limitations, trying to walk when you were supposed to crawl, trying to stand when you should have just kept crawling. But sometime, over time, we make it a little more difficult, don't we? We add things in, add some more fancy structures to it, try to plug in. Right? And then trying to get back to the basics is a little hard. But sometimes you just have to figure out how to get back to the basics. And it's usually not hard. <laughs> a lot of bites. But Still going to be here for a couple of minutes. Most of us, most of what limits us from reaching our full potential, most of what limits you all from achieving your goals for this year will have very little to do with this company. It will. Because they've got training for you. They've got curriculum for you. They've got coaches for you. And from what I hear, even more is coming, right? It's more, more, more. How do we put the, how do we put the gas on the fire to help the best people become even better? Sadly, <clears throat> a lot of that will go to little value because the human stuff, the muck of life, either clouds your vision from being able to see it and use it or slows you down to the point it, you just, it just gets in the way. And so when you're thinking about success, especially at business, Know that the guys at the top have your back. I, I know all of you feel that, right? It's, it's about what you can do to have your own back. You might need to go see a therapist, someone you can talk to. Not someone at work, but someone you can just clear your mind with. You might need to go do more than that. You might need to get a coach, someone that you pay money to, so you can share with them, like, hey, I'm going through this thing. Am I crazy? Am I nutty? Do I need something? Am I, am I, am I viewing the world wrong? You will rise to the level of your biggest weakness. Think about that. What's your biggest weakness right now? Is it you know, faithfulness or discipline to your activities? Think about where we started the day. One of the questions, number two, what are the patterns of my life? I think if you look inside the patterns, you might see your weakness. And then when you see that weakness, know that even if all these other things in your life, maybe it's making money or your business career track, even if they become this massive pinnacle of success that you've climbed, you will always fall back down to the level of your biggest weakness. You'll find a way to fuck it up. You'll create that pattern again of loss, of having to restart it all over again. So. What's really cool about days like this uh, is that you get a, we, we all get a chance to kind of like reboot, kind of look inside ourselves in a place where you've got loyal teammates that you can trust, right? And we can just say, what do I want in the first place? And it might not have to do anything to do with work. It might just, that's a part of it. That's what pays the bills, right? That's what allows me to live the life of my dreams. I want this other stuff. What do I really want? And then what will make my life matter, right? At the end of the day, when I'm on my last breath, what's, what's, what am I going to be proudest about? And just like the light bulb that we all took a snack on, remember, getting that thing, even if it seems impossible, is always possible when you break it down into a series of tiny little pieces. And then you execute the right steps, 
in the right place and do it long enough in what seems to be sharp and scary and something that could cut your throat and cut your tongue and cause you misery and pain, you find is really nothing but bits of sand all along. And that's the power that each one of you have. Thank you so much for letting me spend some time with you today.